Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we're taking you through the best bits of The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, why good people are divided by politics and religion. Sometimes it can be pretty hard for people to get along, people from uh, different groups or people who see the world differently, but we're all stuck here for a fair while. We're all around for hopefully seven, eight, nine, ten decades, and uh, society's going to live on much longer than that, so we should try to get along at least. We should just try and get along. It's a, it's a, it's a lyric in a song, <laughs> and someone quoted it back in the day, but at least we can try and understand why we are so easily divided into hostile groups sometimes. And each one of the groups who are opposing sometimes have their own kind of righteousness. And what Heitz is going to do in this book, he takes us on a tour of human nature and history from the perspective of moral psychology. When John was a young teenager, he wished for world peace, which is a nice lofty goal to aim for. It'd be a nice one, wouldn't it? <laughs> now he's maybe he's a little bit jaded in his, uh, as he's got older, but he now yearns not for world peace. Well, he probably does still want world peace, but his, his new, I guess, uh, dream vision is a world in which competing ideologies are kept in balance. Ooh, it's getting a bit more difficult today and today, a bit more of a loftier goal, you could say, than world peace, quite literally. But in this book, what he does, he draws on the latest research in neuroscience, genetics, social psychology, evolutionary modeling. and But the big take-home uh, message of the book, it's a real ancient one that goes well beyond all those wanky um, sort of new theories that are coming out today. And it is the realization that we are all self-righteous hypocrites. Yes, as... Uh Matt, how do you quote these? Matthew 7, 3, 5. 3, say verse 3 to 5. Verse 3 to 5. Uh, Big Matthew, he said, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but you do not notice the log in your own? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. So as you say, man, we've been hypocrites for a bloody long time and, and even more so today. A big whack from Matthew there. <laughs> but enlightenment and wisdom requires us all to take the logs out of our own eyes and escape from this ceaseless petty and devices moralism that we all engage in. If we want to understand ourselves, our limits and our potential, we need to take a step back, drop all this moralism and the pondering and apply some moral psychology and analyze the game that we're all playing together. Jonathan, he's a, a moral psychologist. He's got a bit of a he's got an online test. We should have found that and linked to it. But if, I'm sure if you search uh, Jonathan Haidt moral test, he's got a few interesting stories here. And it's just a you know straight story. It's not a real story. It's a made up example. But just think if anyone did anything wrong here. The first story he talks about there was a, a family that had a dog. They loved their dog. The dog had got out one day, got killed by a car in front of their house. And the family, they'd kind of heard the dog meat was pretty delicious. So they cut up their dog's body, cooked it, ate it for dinner, paid their respects. Nobody saw them do this. It was just the family. It was their own dog. The dog was already dead. And they had a nice tasty dinner to respect their beloved pet. Old scruffy. Old That's scruffy it. for dinner. But if you like most people, <laughs> you probably have a feel of disgust, really. Um, but you hesitated before saying the family had done anything morally wrong. Because after all, the dog was dead already, yep. Yeah. They didn't was. hurt the dog. And it was their dog. So what else, you know, could you do with the carcass? No nothing nothing bad there in that sense. Yeah. Is it even reading it though, it's still there's a bit of a pang of to disgust. Just, yeah, that's for sure. He's got another story here. Uh, again, just a made up story and you just gotta kind of assess your own morals to think about where you where you draw the line here. But there was a man goes to the supermarket once a week. He buys a chicken. He always cooks it up, eats the chicken. Uh, nice, tasty dinner. But what he does is before cooking the chicken, he has sexual intercourse with this chicken and then he cooks it and eats it. Jesus. He's uh, he's had a bit, bit of a dry spell, this guy, I think, you could say, <laughs> at the mate, very but, least. Mate, but no harm. No, nobody else knows. The chicken was was already you know killed and prepared and he's just doing the, his own thing in his own house, but... You could argue, like the dog eating family, it's an efficient use of resources at the at the very least, right? <laughs> but here's the disgust feeling. Whereas before the disgust, <laughs> I see there's there's different uh, you know herbs and spices to season a. a- <laughs> <laughs> oh mate, that's <laughs> probably too far. That is a bit too far, especially for your, your morning coffee. <laughs> that's right. But like the disgust there with Astro's comment and this story in general. It's just much stronger and, and somewhat degrading. But does this make it right or wrong, this person doing it, mm. having sex with a chicken before they cook it? And uh, most really give a nuanced answer in the West. Yeah, we, we kind of think it's uh, morally wrong. Like it just 
feels like the wrong thing to do, even though we can kind of see, okay, no, nobody was hurt, no animals were hurt, but we can kind of see the difference between like the, the legal side versus the ethical or moral side that, okay, fine, there was nothing legally wrong, you shouldn't be sent to jail perhaps, but there's still something a bit wrong about it. So some actions we see as wrong, even though they don't hurt anyone. No one was hurt in that sense. Someone got excited, but no one net, there was net no pain, no one hurt. And understanding this simple fact that morality, it's different around the world everywhere you go. And this uh, understanding is really the first step towards understanding our righteous minds and how, how this morality works um, inside of us. Statistically, he uh, had done this study on thousands of different people and he found that uh, 38% of people that heard these uh, harmless stories claimed that somebody or something was harmed. So, for example, the, that dog story, many people said, well, the family, they could have been harmed because maybe they could get sick from the dog meat. Uh, but that was like kind of just some moral reasoning that people were doing later. Um, they were condemning the actions because they kind of saw the harms. They were kind of going a uh, bit of reverse logic here. There was, there was, they were saying they shouldn't have done it because they th- thought maybe there's some harm coming down the track. Yeah, so often it took a while for them to come up with a victim, but when you've got that flash of feeling of disgust when you hear these stories, your brain just starts looking for uh, what the moral thing wrong mm. is in it, even though <laughs> no one got harmed. So, um, a lot of the, the people in these surveys, they always offered up victims half-heartedly and almost apologetically. And the research participants kept coming up with victims and then the, uh, the, the researchers kind of just like, uh, paneled it away and said, um, gave him reasons why yeah. uh, nobody got harmed. So, but they kept searching for, for victims, <laughs> but they were morally dumbfounded in the end because they were they're speechless um, with this inability to explain intuitively what they felt. Yeah, right? It just right. feels you can't fuck a chicken before you eat it. <laughs> so your brain right. just con- <laughs> finds any reason why that's wrong. Yeah, exactly. As you said, like maybe they're like, well, the chicken was harmed. It's like, well, no, the chicken was kind of already dead. Well, maybe the bloke was harmed. Well. He kind of it was his own choice to sort of do it, and like Wrapped they kept going down these paths just to try to put something logical towards what they were feeling emotionally. So these subjects, they were reasoning, they were working really hard at reasoning, but it wasn't reasoning in search of the the objective truth here. It was reasoning in support of their emotional reactions. And uh, there was a bloke called David Hume who described this sort of reasoning in 1739. He said, "Reason is and ought only to be the slave of passions." and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. <laughs> That's right. So, it's saying that you, you, know, you, you think that you're reasoning because you're some objective, uh, hoity-toity philosopher and academic that you're trying to find the correct reasons. But really, even back in the 1700s, Hume was saying, you know what, it's just really your, your passions, your emotions, and the reasons are just a slave to them. That's right. Doing so, the dirty work. So, yeah, moral reasoning is the, often the servant of moral emotions, and it really... And it really ties into a point that the intuitive dog has a rational tail. Mm. It's interesting that if you think of a dog, a dog gets happy and then its tail wags somewhat uncontrollably. It just happens. But you can't go the other way around. You can't grab its tail, vigorously wag it from side to side, and that makes the dog happy. Yeah, it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty uh, interesting metaphor. We're going to unpack it a bit more. <laughs> but when you think about it, yeah, you got uh, it, the intuitive dog. So, as you said, happy, just to break it down yep. again. And then you got the tail wagging behind it, and that's the rationality. That's like the reasoning coming up is like a tail wagging, mm. but it's just following what the emotional dog is. But all mm. all the person sees is um, themselves as a bit more objective, but in reality, you're just a tail wagging. You've actually got no <laughs> control over the dog in that sense. That's right. We think that our reasons come to us first, and our the reasons dictate the morals. So we find the reason that this is bad, so we have this moral judgment about it. But that's like saying that like we're wagging the tail, and the, the dog gets happy. Whereas it actually goes the other way around. You get your emotions first. You get that pang of, what, they ate a dog? That pang first. What the hell? What was that guy doing with that chicken? You get the emotional pang first. That leads to the moral judgment. And then finally, you find the reasons afterwards. You're making up these reasons. So it's not that the reasons come first. It's actually the emotions come first. And then the reasons just justify those emotions that you felt. Here's another story for you. You got Julie and Mark, their sister and brother, traveling together through France. Uh, it's a romantic night in, in, in the summer of love in Paris, and they were both on summer vacation from college. They thought it'd be interesting and a bit of fun to, to get it on, start making some love, even though they're brother and sister, but at least it'd be a new experience, right? They'd both enjoy it, and they'd just do it as one-off and then never do it again. And they'd keep the secret between them. Uh, Mark will wrap it up, 
Rappy is, is old fella rap, so there's going to be no no harm of kids and all, everything like that. And they believe it's going to make their relationship feel closer than ever. Yeah, again, quite literally. <laughs> well, yeah, what do we think about that one? It's a, a, another one of uh, Johnny's stories that he comes up with. And again, there's, we might think of the, the reasons. Like you might think... It's a okay, feeling of well, disgust again to begin with. It does pop up. And then you think, well, you know, if, uh, you know, if we've heard scientifically that if a brother and sister have kids, there's some kind of, you know, potential deformity from incest. That's one reason. But then you can clearly say, well, no, nah, they, you know, they played it safe. They did the right thing. She's on the pill. He bagged up. So it's, we can cross that potential reason off the list. Yeah. Then the participants were, were saying who were feeling disgusted, hey, I just think it was wrong. You know, how old were they? And the research said they're about 20 years old. Um, and they go, oh, shit. No, 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 no. It's just something you're not brought up to do. It's just not, well, I mean, uh, it, I guess you're just not brought up for it. <laughs> and then, you know, they they keep coming up with reasons. They say, look, whatever you're saying, there's just no way you can change my mind. I feel how I feel. Uh, I feel it's it's crazy. It's gross. I wouldn't do it. You can't convince me that there's any reason to do this. So, it's, it's clear that in this situation, right, the reasoning is merely the servant of the passions. The person deep down just feels emotionally disgusted about it and then all the reasoning just follows that even though the reasoning can sometimes make no sense, just wagging its tail for no bloody reason. And then at the end of it, uh, after every reason was batted away with a baseball bat, then they just ended up being morally dumbfounded again. So, emotions, they're, they're kind of hard to define. They occur without us really even thinking about it. But emotions aren't dumb. It's not just like we're just emotionally jumping from uh, idea to idea. They're actually part of a normal information processing. It's really just part of our thinking. In the happiness hypothesis, Jonathan Haidt, yeah, he wrote that book and it's come up a lot of times. Um, this metaphor of the rider and the elephant that he came up with. So, if you think about it, you got this big bloody... Uh, chunker of an elephant, right? All the power is there. The elephant is going in one direction and then you've got the rider uh, sitting on top. So, you know, the rider might be under the impression that it's in, in control, but really what the elephant wants to do, if the elephant wants to go somewhere, the rider's just going along with it, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. The elephant is your automatic processes. That's your emotion, your intuitions, all the things that just pop into your brain without you really consciously thinking of it, but you feel it anyway. And then the rider, it's kind of the logical reasoning why. And he says he chose an elephant rather than a horse because an elephant is so much bigger and, and stronger. Like the rider, you can kind of, if you're a rider, you can kind of dictate what a horse does, but on an elephant, you've got no chance. It's really the elephant's going where it wants to go. So the rider's got a few things in its back pocket it can do. It can look into the future, meaning it can help the elephant make better decisions in the present, it can learn new skills, master new technologies. And most importantly, the rider acts as a spokesperson for the elephant in this sense of righteousness. So even though it doesn't necessarily know what is going on in the elephant's mind, uh, and if elephant's heading in one direction, the rider is the one fabricating post hoc explanations for whatever the elephant is doing and wherever it's going. So if the elephant's going toward the waterhole saying uh, this is morally wrong, the rider's not pulling the elephant in the other direction to say this is morally right. It's following the elephant, then coming up with all sorts of reasons why the elephant's heading in that direction. <laughs> That's right. It's just saying that my elephant, it's thirsty. It needs a drink. It's not saying, no, you know what? You had a drink already. Let's go down a different path. Uh, <laughs> and this kind of model of the, the rider and the elephant, it gives a good explanation as to why moral and political arguments can be so frustrating because we kind of think we're a rider talking to another rider, but really the elephants are the ones that are in control all the time. It's like uh, if we're trying to talk to the rider, we're trying to grab the dog's tail and wag it to make it happy. But instead, you got to just make the dog happy first and the, the wagging will kind of come along for the ride. Yeah, it is frustrating. So, take any topic. Um, and this is what really the point is, is, is how to actually uh, uh, engage in political arguments or arguments that are, involve the righteous mind. And it is understanding that you are speaking to an elephant heading in one direction and also understanding that you're also on an elephant in another direction. <laughs> and you're right. both just speaking as, as riders. So, the only way to actually engage... Uh, with people is to begin with the elephant to elephant sort of mindset. And out of all the people we've read, uh, and according to Jonathan Haidt, one of the best elephant whisperers of all time was the great Dale Carnegie. How to win friends and influence people. You know, Carnegie had a whole bunch of these different, uh, quite simple ideas. Begin in a friendly way, smile, be a good listener, never tell somebody they're wrong. Uh, it's really about getting to their side first. And as, as Henry Ford said, if there was one secret to success... It lies in the ability to get to the other person's point of view and see things from their angle as well as your own. 
Now, mm. all these things, Dale Carnegie, uh, you might dismiss it as it's so obvious, it's so easy, it's so basic, but so few people actually do this. And so people just go straight into combat mode whenever these moral things pop up or political things pop up. They just go straight to war as opposed to actually trying to understand mm. the other person's side. Yeah. Like, even things like smiling, it just seems just so point, oh, not pointless, but it just, just doesn't, logically, it just doesn't seem to make sense or having a warm handshake or greeting them, or, you know, just seeking first to understand, making them feel understood before you actually move on and, and get to your elephant time. Because if you really want to change someone's mind or on a moral or political matter, you have to see it from their angle first, and then as well as your own. And if you truly see it as the other person's, from their perspective, deeply and intuitively, you're going to end up opening their mind for your response. And so here, empathy is really the antidote to righteousness. So, the big kicker of what we've kind of gone on, on this journey talking about dogs and chickens and, and brothers and sisters is that… Paris and <laughs> elephants and riders. That's There's been right. a lot going on in this There's station. been a lot going on and that uh, the bottom line is that the human mind is very similar to an animal mind in that we're constantly reacting intuitively to everything that we perceive around us and then we're basing our responses on those reactions and it's that the, the emotional reaction comes first and then the logical reasoning comes later. So, intuitions come first. So, if you think about our elephant and all the directions we get pulled in, um, being being our riders, we're taking a bit of creative license <laughs> here, uh, bridging a bunch of metaphors. But what he's got is the six different directions, really, that the elephant get, can get pulled. And, and with that, then that way we can understand where someone could be heading. And because of that, we can speak to that elephant and then end up letting, you know, also just let them understand where our elephant's heading. Make more sense soon. <laughs> That's right. So, he sent the six different, uh, are they axes? They're sort of axes, I guess, yeah. that you can get pulled uh, in, in either direction A or direction B. The first one of these he talks about is the care slash harm foundation. So, he says that reptiles, they get a bit of a rap, bad rap for being cold, not just cold-blooded, but cold-hearted as well. Some reptile mothers, they pop out a bunch of eggs and then they bail and once the eggs hatch, they're on their own. It's pretty cheap, evolutionary, as in they put in the small investment to lay a bunch of eggs and then just the good ones survive, the bad ones don't. Yeah, it is a pretty good metaphor, that one, isn't it? If someone's cold-hearted, just like a big corporation who just doesn't care about anyone, that's that, or another reptile out there, Bill Gates. Um, if you've been <laughs> watching a few of those movies, you'll understand that he might be cold-hearted. He according is a bit to some. Of a reptile. <laughs> mammals, on the other hand, they make fewer bets, but when they do, they invest a lot more in each one. So, us mammals are a bit better than those reptiles, <laughs> like Billy. That's right. It's, very, it's a very different approach. The reptile approach to you know healthy production is lay a bunch of of eggs and the best ones survive, the mammals is very different because I know they've only got a couple of bullets in the chamber that they invest a hell of a lot into each one to make sure it can survive. They want to you know, care for the vulnerable. We want to protect um, children and the young, keep it safe, keep it alive, keep it away from harm. Yeah, so that's the it's a really strong foundation across all of us is care harm, particularly when it comes to children. I think anyone mm. who doesn't want to see a child get hurt and it really just spikes up across the board. But when it comes to, um, say, the political level, it can be quite different how this manifests in the world. So, um, you know, if, if you drive past, there's a lot of cars with different bumper stickers and a lot of them really do link to this Care Harm Foundation. Yeah, just kind of like cuteness is like a bit of a trigger for this Care Harm Foundation. So, if you see a bumper sticker that stopped the genocide and you see a whole bunch of kids who are about to be, you know, they're vulnerable to attack from big, powerful organizations, and that's like a good trigger to want to protect those kids. You know, similarly, like a don't tread on me, animal welfare, you see cute little animals that are being run over by bulldozers, that triggers that sort of care uh, element in you to want to go and support that cause. Yeah, so, you know, compared to left wing and right wing, left wing is a really, really, really strong uh, foundation for this uh sort of uh, viewpoint of the world and, you know, any sort of um, care for, for someone who just seems like they haven't been given the best cards in the world, uh, this would be really strong for the left. But for the right hand, right wingers, the bumper sticker might say something like, hey, support our wounded. And the driver is trying to get you to care about what they care about, you know, supporting veterans who have actually sacrificed themselves trying to um, protect their, their country. That's the Care Harm Foundation. The second one is the Fairness Cheating Foundation. And so, he says, you know, if you're taking off for a week-long vacation to the Caribbean and then your co-worker says, you know what, I reckon I can handle your work for another five days on top of that. Take two weeks instead. You kind of, at first, you're like, 
Okay, that sounds great. But then you're thinking, oh, hang on, what's going on here? I'm going to have to pay him back somehow. If I buy a bottle of scotch from the uh, duty-free at the airport on the way back, that probably doesn't cut it. I'm going to have to go over and above to pay back this, this big favor that they've given me because we know there's some kind of fairness element in everything that we do. Yeah, it's that uh, a feeling of reciprocity if someone buys you a beer. Just naturally, most people um, feel like they have to. And I think it's morally wrong. It, it does feel morally wrong if, you know, everyone's got that group of mates. If you're out for eight people, that one person who never buys that round the <laughs> next day, and that is like um, pulling on this moral foundation, uh, I think. Don't, don't you reckon? <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Um, and if we go think back to some of the evolution types of books that we do, the idea that the genes are selfish and that the genes want to continue their own line. But just because the genes are selfish, it can actually mean that the, the creatures that are holding those genes, uh, you know, us humans, we can actually be generous because we want to work together. And sometimes being generous is actually the best way for the genes to be selfish. Yeah, it is in there. So this, again, manifests itself differently for, for left and right wingers. So on the left, this fairness foundation or cheating, it's all about equality, you could say, of outcome, right? Like, uh, it doesn't matter what people do in the world. Everyone needs some things like it might be healthcare, education, uh, a roof over their shoulders, never to be hungry. And across the board, everyone needs that. But then on the right wing is fairness to them means about proportionality or equality of opportunity. So, you know, it doesn't matter what so where everyone ends up. It just matters how people start. And if someone works their ass off and ends up a multi-multi-billionaire, then that's fairness because they've actually performed, um, you know, deserve it based on their contributions to the world. The third different elephant puller is the loyalty... Elephant betray- puller foundation. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. The loyalty betrayal foundation. So, uh, everybody likes doing things that lead towards some kind of group cohesion and even sometimes conflicts between different groups can actually strengthen your own group. And there's a big... It's a big trigger to the brain here. The elephant gets really triggered by loyalty, people sticking to the group, or betrayal, people going against the group. Yeah, we all believe that Judas is a dick from back in the day, um, or like even in your in your work, right? That Machiavellian mind, which we've um, sort of endorsed a bit on the podcast sometimes, <laughs> oh, yeah. but if you get caught out on the wrong side of that and you catch someone out being really highly political, that's that moral foundation. It just doesn't feel right what they're doing. Um, and this is the, the loyalty betrayal foundation. This feeling of tribalism in your group and your team, um, you know, or if something, oh, maybe I was going to go to an AFL, but maybe that's a bit too far. <laughs> I think. It's a, definitely a big trigger on the, on the brain, on the elephant, on the, the morals. Whenever you see somebody who's being a team player, they're doing things that contribute to what you see as the, the right thing as your team, that's fantastic. Whenever you see someone going against it, it's a very quick way to get that dog's tail wagon, just to add that metaphor back in. <laughs> Maybe it's not wagging. I don't Maybe know. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Number four, mate. The fourth foundation is the authority uh, subversion foundation. And this is the urge to respect hierarchical uh, relationships uh, between us and it, to the point where many language encode it directly, right? Yeah. The French have got two different forms of saying, uh, speaking to people, there's the vu or the tu form depending on if you're close or not so close or like if, if you're trying to be like personal versus professional i think even in english as well you know you got mr jones very formal then you got adam for a friend and then jonesy for a very close friend so even those the different ways of referring to people kind of are a signal to say where that person is standing in the hierarchy yeah so uh, the authority foundation is pretty complex because it's up towards experiences and down towards subordinates so, for example, you know, if there's an old person on a train or something and you don't stand up or treat him with, with respect, then according to them and maybe those around who think, hey, that's just morally wrong, uh, you got to treat your elders with respect. So, you know, that might be a manifestation there. Um, and just in general, like the, the political right in this sense feel strongly for this foundation compared to the left. What Jonathan says is perhaps the right are more spread out across all the foundations where the the left and more, uh, the center of gravity there is really towards that care, harm foundation and that feeling towards compassion for all. Yeah, the right definitely uh, believe more strongly that there should be you know, more structure and hierarchy in place, whereas the left are probably against hierarchy and saying that everybody should be much more equal. The fifth one is the sanctity degradation foundation. We had to Google those uh, definitions before this. And it, it really was, it's, a, it's about, I guess, holding certain things on a pedestal and not wanting to see the degradation of society, not wanting to see things come to ruin, wanting to keep things uh, almost wholly in nature. 
Yeah, so I think uh, things that are dirty and polluted, I'd say those early stories we're talking about, like fucking a chicken and um, having sex with <laughs> siblings, all that sort of stuff, is probably this, right? Like that, that, that is higher levels of purpose that you can't do it. You just can't do it. You just can't fuck a chicken, can you? <laughs> you just can't do it. Um, so, sort of that above the human level, right? Yeah, that's right. So, number, number six now, mate, is the uh, Liberty Oppression Foundation. So, we've got an example here of when Barack Obama launched a $75 billion program to help homeowners who had borrowed more money than they could repay uh, help them with their loans. So, in one sense, you got Obama uh, trying to pull out $75 billion because those bloody banks, they fucked over pretty much the, the, the borrowers at the time. So, we're trying to help them out. But then, so that's a, you say a left-wing sort of view of this. But then a right-winger, Rick Santali, he said... Mate, how many, how many of you people want to pay for your neighbor's mortgage that has an extra bathroom and can't pay the bills? Obama, are you listening? Mm. They're probably not listening to each other because they're both riding elephants in different <laughs> That's directions. <laughs> That's right. The, the, the big driver here is the, the feeling of uh, resentment or reactions against people who are trying to... You feel like they're trying to dominate you or they're trying to restrict your liberty. So, in this sense, you know, Obama... Is on the you know trying to help and support everybody, the people who have we'll create that liberty for the people in the bottom rung of society, right? Give them enough freedom mm. to have their own home and and what comes with yeah, that. Yeah, that's it. Not to be kicked out of their home, not to be on the street, and so that kind of uh, you know if you're on that side, you can see where th- he's coming from. And then Big Rick on the other side is saying, well, this is like uh, he's feeling the oppression side. He's saying, well, what? So I've got to pay money out of my hard earned to give to somebody else who wasn't smart enough, who did the wrong things, who borrowed too much, and now I'm paying for their mortgage. Um, and so he's feeling that you know the government's you know reaching over, sticking their hand in his pocket, pulling out his cash, and giving it to somebody else less deserving. So he's feeling oppressed. So we've been on a long journey through this book. If you were to bring a few things home from this trip, say firstly, perhaps start looking at yourself a bit differently. You're a small rider on a very big bloody <laughs> elephant. Um, you're trying to pull your hardest with the, the reins on this elephant, but it's really the elephant that is, is still on the show here and knows where it's going. A lot of the time, we probably see ourselves as this uh, big, strong rider, and maybe we're not riding an elephant. Maybe we've got a little rat on a string, and we can control the rat to go wherever we want. But really, we've got to realize actually, we're not on it. We're not trying to guide a little rat or a little mouse anywhere. It's actually a big ass elephant, and they've got a lot more strength and power than we do. So the emotional side is going to be far more powerful than the, our sort of rational, logical side. That's it. So when you catch yourself creating ridiculous post hoc arguments for, for, for some things that might come up, and you know, it's, it's happening more than ever where people are just speaking totally past each mm. other. Even if someone's wrong sometimes, you think objectively you've caught them out wrong. They're going to be just creating these post hoc <laughs> arguments. You're never going to win the battle. And probably even more so, you're going to be doing it yourself as well, right? Yeah, that's right. You've got to realize the emotions, the reactions come first. And then the, the things that you're saying come later just in support of those emotions. So, beware uh, the people who insist that there's only one true morality for all times, people and places. They might think that this one foundation uh, out of the six that we've already outlined is is the be-all and end-all. It's not the case. There's actually six moral foundations. You might have a bias or a blind spot to mm. not see it, one of them for some reason, um, but we got to understand where other people are coming from. Then there is merit in all the foundations that their they're writers are sort of speaking to. Yeah, I think understanding all these gives you a, a good overview then. If you can know when somebody says something, you can say, oh, they're, they're dropping into you know the fairness cheating here, whereas I was thinking, about the sanctity degradation or something like that. So you've got to realize that next time you find yourself in one of these discussions, somebody says something that you don't quite agree with, you know, maybe give this different approach a try. Don't just jump straight in. Don't just go straight to war. Don't just go battling them with your own uh, post hoc, you know, rational based on emotional. Uh, don't bring up morality until you actually find a few points in common first. Go the Carnegie route of trying to understand them before just going to battle. So we're all hit, stuck here for a while. We need to take the time out to understand where everyone's coming from. So let's all try and work it out. 